analysis and monitoring of gas exchange. The learning objectives are Describe the difference between monitoring and analysis. Describe the two types of electrochemical oxygen analyzers. Describe calibration and problem solving techniques for oxygen analyzers. State how to obtain, process, and analyze arterial and capillary blood gas samples. List the quality control procedures applied to blood gas analysis. List the potential advantages of point of care testing. Describe how to obtain and interpret transcutaneous oxygen and carbon dioxide monitoring. Describe the basic principles used by an oximeter to monitor oxygen saturation. State when and how to perform pulse oximetry. Identify true statements related to interpretation of pulse oximetry results. Describe how to perform capnometry and interpret capnograms. Analysis versus monitoring. Laboratory analysis is the discrete measurements of fluid or tissue that must be removed from the body. Such measurements are made with an analyzer. Monitoring is an ongoing process by which clinicians obtain and evaluate dynamic physiological processes in a timely manner, usually at bedside. This is done with a monitor. Invasive versus non-invasive procedures. Invasive procedures require insertion of a sensor or collection device into the body. Non-invasive monitors is a means of gathering data externally. So it might be that we're just we're counting the respiratory rate or we're looking at the cardiopulmonary monitor. It's not necessarily invasive. Generally, invasive procedures provide more accurate data but carry a greater risk. After the gradient between the non-invasive and invasive method is established, then you can use that information to make informed decisions. Measuring the FiO2. Most bedside systems used to measure FiO2 utilize electrochemical principles. The two most common are the polygraphic electrode, also called the Clark electrode for the guy that invented it, and number two, the galvanic fuel cell. The polygraphic electrode requires a battery and offers a 10 to 30 second response time. The galvanic fuel cell requires no battery, but it takes some 60 seconds to offer a, a stable value. So any, any of these that you're using, you may need to wait, wait on them a little while until the, the numbers stabilize to, so that you can assure that it's an accurate reading. This is figure 18-1 on page 382. This is a polar graphic analyzer. Polar meaning means that it's, it's you know this is very similar to a, like a nine volt battery. You have a, a positive terminal and a negative terminal, and that's that's exactly what it is. And the oxygen that flows through this membrane on the bottom actually is what creates the current. And so then you have a current meter that changes the result into a, either a partial pressure or a percentage. Troubleshooting of these analyzers. Calibration according to the manufacturer's recommendation must be done before using the device. And that, that would be typically at least once a day or if it's been a while, recalibrate it. Failure to calibrate or inconsistent readings are signs of malfunction. The best way to avoid these problems is through preventive maintenance. If the analyzer fails to calibrate, the problem could be related to low batteries, a sensor depletion because they typically require electrolyte solutions, or electronic failure. Sampling and analyzing of blood gases. Analyzing arterial blood samples is an important part of diagnosing and treating patients with respiratory failure. The radial artery is the most often used because it's near the surface and it's easy to stabilize. You can verify collateral circulation with using the modified Allen's test. Even though they're not large, they, there are veins near the site, but they're not like if you were sticking somewhere else. And the radial puncture is relatively pain-free. Not. Arterial cannulation can be done if frequent sampling is needed.
So that's, a, that's an art line, is what they're talking about. This is the way you perform a modified Allen's test. And this is figure 18-3 on page 386. But basically what's happening here in, in part A here, in section A, you occlude both the radial and the ulnar arteries. Once you do that, then you have the patient make a fist. And what this does is it squeezes all the blood out of the hand. And the hand should blanch at this point. You have them open their hand so that you can identify the blanching. And then you're going to release the pinky side artery. And, we need, and what we're trying to identify here is that that artery is, is functioning properly in case we mess the other one up while we puncture it. Because we're going to puncture the thumb side. Your hand should return to its pink original state in less than 10 seconds. The amount of blood that you want to collect is about 0.5 to 1 mL. You always want to get enough to run the blood sample two or three times. Because sure enough, if you only get enough to run it once, the analyzer will eat your blood, and then you're going to have to go repuncture the patient. So get enough to run it two or three times and save the patient an extra puncture. The actual volume depends on the anticoagulant used, the requirements of the specific analyzer, and whether or not other tests will be perform performed on the obtained sample. So it's not uncommon for us to draw blood for the lab or even some for the nurse if they need to do a glucose test or something like that. So you, you can always get more if you need, but typically it's less than 1 mL. Safety concerns? You never recap a needle without a safety device. You never handle using both hands and never point it toward any part of the body. This is very important because needle sticks are, are a very common injury in the hospital and they're not fun for anybody involved. You never bend, break, or remove used needles from syringes by hand. And you always dispose of the used syringes, needles, and other sharp items in appropriate puncture-resistant sharps containers. In fact, when Jayco comes around, they'll just at random pick a couple of um, sharps containers, cut them open, and, and see if all the needles inside there have been disposed of properly. And of course, there's a healthy fine with it if they find some that weren't disposed of properly. Indications for arterial sampling? Just pick something. <laughs> it's almost like albuterol. Uh, lots of reasons. Sudden unexplained dyspnea, acute shortness of breath or tachypnea, abnormal breath sound, cyanosis, heavy use of accessory muscles, changes in ventilator settings, CPR, diffuse infiltrates in chest x-ray, new infiltrates, sudden cardiac arrhythmias, and acute hypotension. There's a couple of different types of errors that can occur here. And as clinicians, we can avoid these pre-analytic errors by ensuring that the sample is obtained anaerobically. In other words, we don't want any gas bubbles inside the blood. So we have to discard the, the air bubbles inside the blood before we run it through the analyzer. And the sooner we can discard those bubbles, the better. Proper anticoagulation, and the blood needs to be analyzed within 10 to 30 minutes. Now that, that's simply because blood is still metabolic. It is using up the oxygen and producing carbon dioxide even as it sits in the syringe. We've been practicing interpretation of the ABGs, and so I would recommend that you do some more practice on the, the software provided in the classroom or in the computer lab. The PAO2 has different ranges as far as hypoxemia is concerned. So from 80 to 100 is normal oxygenation. PAO2 of 60 to 79 is mild hypoxemia. 40 to 59 is moderate. And less than 40 millimeters of mercury is severe hypoxemia. And of course, we want the saturation to be normal greater than or equal to 95%. The CaO2, now which includes the hemoglobin value, should be 18 to 20 volumes percent. 
indwelling catheters, or basically arterial lines. They provide ready access for blood sampling. They allow continuous monitoring of vascular pressures, and that was really their indication, is if you need to monitor the blood pressures continuously. So it saves us a puncture on the patient is just kind of a benefit of that. Infection and thrombosis are more likely than intermittent punctures if you have that indwelling catheter. So you got to keep that thing clean and you, you have a continuous infusion of heparin or saline solution, but not a lot, maybe three mLs an hour, but you, you have to keep it clean. So you got to make sure that's the case. So anytime we use these, we got to make sure that they're cleaned when we're finished. The normal routes are the peripheral arteries, such as the radial brachial, the femoral artery, central vein, or the pulmonary artery. The access for sampling blood for most intravascular lines is provided by a three-way stopcock. And that's what you have pictured here. This is called a three-way stopcock. And you see that the valve on top here has the the word off printed on it. So whichever way this valve is directed is turned off and the flow of liquid or solution is through the other two, either from the transducer to the patient or from the patient to the transducer, which wherever way it's going to move. The pulmonary artery catheter has a separate blood, blood sampling and IV infusion ports and they balloon at the tip. So that's your Swan-Gans catheter. This is figure 18-4 on page 389. This is a brachial artery catheter. Right here is the transducer. This is actually what turns the pressure into a digital signal that you read on the monitor. And so there, that's the pressure transducer. The catheter is stuck in the arm, in the, in the artery right here and then you have a pressure bag an IV solution usually a saline solution or a heparin heparinized solution this pressurized bag has to be the pressure on this thing needs to be greater than the blood pressure so that it pushes the fluid into the artery typically at a very slow rate but it has to overcome that arterial pressure so that it can keep it clean, so that you have a continuous flow of this heparin solution into the catheter, through the catheter, keeping it clean so that it doesn't clot. So here's a little bit more detail about that three-way stopcock. See again, somewhere on here, it's got a valve that's labeled off. Whichever way that, that valve, that off is pointing, that particular section of that three-way stopcock is turned off. So you see here in section A that the sample port itself is turned off. So this is going to be what you what you leave or what you the way you find the, the stopcock arranged because it allows for continuous reading and so you have the flush solution going to and from the patient directly. When it's time to draw a sample then what you do is section B here. You turn the flush solution off or the transducer area off and what that does is that opens the port and now it is in communication with the patient and so you can draw blood out of it in this configuration. Once you have your blood out then what you have to do is you have to go to section C here and now what you do is you you drain the flush solution, which is now right got blood in it. It's not solution at this point. It's got blood, and also the sample port has uh, blood in it too. So you have to now flush this line out. And fl and so what you're going to do is you're going to clean this this section out, and then once you put it back to the the normal setting back up here in section A, then you're going to flush the rest of the blood back into the patient. Okay, and there's a there's a little valve over on the bedside that says arterial on it, and you turn that valve or you open that valve, 
and it'll flush the blood back into the patient. All you got to do is clean the line. You don't have to flush a whole bunch in there. Just make sure there's no blood left in the line because if there is, it's going to clot. The VAMP Adult System, excellence in closed needleless blood sampling. The innovative Edwards VAMP Adult System is the first generation of venous arterial blood management protection. The VAMP Adult System standardizes blood sampling techniques for consistency, accuracy, and safety you can depend on. The VAMP Adult System is available with or without an Edwards True Wave Disposable Pressure Transducer for a complete solution that protects clinicians from unnecessary exposure to blood, enhances patient safety, and protects your hospital's bottom line. Setup, priming, sampling, and flushing are quick and easy with the VAMP Adult System. The VAMP Adult Reservoir has a 5cc capacity that allows for ample clearing volume and can be used at the bedside next to the patient right where you need it. The self-sealing pre-slit non-latex Z-Site sample port is designed to enable the collection of undiluted samples while greatly reducing residual blood buildup and reducing the chance of infection. The blunt cannula design provides safety during the process by eliminating accidental needle sticks associated with blood sampling. The direct draw system with blunt cannula provides an extra level of efficiency and convenience by enabling blood to be pulled directly into a vacuum tube. The Edwards VAMP family of closed blood sampling systems is designed to protect the patient and the clinician from complications associated with traditional sampling techniques. Traditional sampling risks involve removal of the stopcock cap and storing so that the inside of the cap remains sterile, accessing the sample port, storing cap, and connecting the waste syringe places the system's sterility at risk. Drawing the clearing volume involves the risk of an inconsistent amount of clearing volume drawn and the risk of diluted lab samples. Discarding the clearing volume wastes the patient's own blood, thus increasing the chance that the patient will require a transfusion. Connecting sample syringes to draw samples requires additional access that increases the risk of contamination of the port. Transferring a blood sample to a vial via a needle puts the clinician at risk for needle stick injury and blood-borne pathogen exposure. Flushing the port to clear residual blood also puts the clinician at risk for blood-borne pathogen exposure. Replacing the stored cap puts the system's sterility at risk for contamination of the cap or sample port. Now that you've been introduced to the VAMP Adult System, let's start our in-service. Once the system is primed, you are ready to draw the clearing volume. Note, depending on the procedure and policy of the hospital, a direct draw unit, blood collection tubes, syringes, blood transfer unit, alcohol preps, and needleless cannula will be needed. First. Firmly squeeze the flexures and slowly draw the reservoir open over 3 to 5 seconds. Then close the shutoff valve by turning the handle perpendicular to the tubing. This is to prevent aspiration of blood from the reservoir. You are now ready to draw the blood sample. To begin, swab the VAMP needleless Z sampling site with disinfectant such as alcohol or other antiseptic depending upon hospital policy. Then push the cannula with the syringe or direct drawing unit onto the sample site. Note: Do not use a hypodermic needle through the sampling site. Now put the vacuum tube into the direct draw unit. Repeat if necessary to complete the blood study requirements. After the last sample has been drawn, grasp the VAMP direct draw unit by the cannula and pull it straight out. Once you have the samples drawn, you need to reinfuse the blood and clear the line. To do this, open the shutoff valve by turning the handle parallel to the tubing. Next, over 3 to 5 seconds, smoothly and evenly push down on the plunger until the flexures lock in place in the fully closed position and all of the fluid has been reinfused into the line.
Finally, flush the vamp system clear by pulling the flush device on the True Wave transducer and swab the sampling site to ensure the removal of any excess blood left on the sampling port. Now that we have learned how to take a sample using the direct draw method, let us review the method of taking a sample using a syringe and blood transfer unit, or BTU. First, gently squeeze the reservoir plunger flexures together. Smoothly and evenly pull up on the reservoir plunger until the plunger stops and the reservoir has reached its 5 cc volume capacity. Once the clearing sample has been drawn, close the reservoir shutoff valve by turning the handle perpendicular to the tubing. This will further ensure that the sample drawn is from the patient and not the reservoir. Swab the vamp needle sampling site with disinfectant, such as alcohol or other antiseptic, depending upon hospital policy. Next, obtain an individually packaged vamp needle cannula and lure tip syringe. Alternatively, Edwards does provide syringes with pre-attached cannula for your convenience. Using aseptic technique, peel open the cannula pouch. Pick up the cannula by the protective shield. Attach the cannula onto a selected lure tip syringe by aligning the cannula lure lock to the lure tip on the syringe and twisting until secure. Ensure that the syringe plunger is depressed to the bottom of the syringe barrel. Push the cannula into the vamp needle sampling site and then draw the required volume of blood into the syringe for sampling. Note, do not use a hypodermic needle through the sampling site. To remove the syringe cannula assembly from the sampling site, grasp the cannula and pull it straight out. Once the last sample has been drawn, open the shutoff valve by turning the handle 90 degrees so that it is parallel to the tubing. Smoothly and evenly push down on the plunger until the flexures lock in place in the fully closed position and all fluid has been reinfused into the line. The recommended time to push the reservoir plunger to the fully closed position is 3 to 5 seconds. The clearing sample should not remain in the reservoir for longer than 3 minutes. Flush the line clear and swab the sampling site, ensuring removal of any excess blood left on the sampling port.